Okay, welcome back again to another episode. And tonight, we're going to be looking at the first part of Jürgen Habermas's book, Legitimation Crisis. This is a book that brings together a lot of sociological theory, um, anthropology, uh, certainly critical theory, a little bit of economic theory. Certainly, there is quite a bit of Marxism. And we're going to be looking at uh, the whole of part one tonight. And what, what I'd like to do is really just focus on a few tools that I think can be very helpful for um, doing some analysis of the text that will make the reading of the text go a little bit more smoothly and allow the um, deeper argument that Habermas is making to surface a little bit more easily and allow it to come up from underneath what might seem like a surface of a lot of jargon. I say jargon because a lot of the language may be unfamiliar to people who've studied philosophy. And it does have a feeling of being very technical. And I can just say, you know, from my personal experience, that it may take a minute or two longer as a reader for the concepts to register and feel how they fit together. But in my own experience, at least, uh, the persistence paid off. And the more that I sat with it and allowed the picture to kind of develop more clearly in my mind, uh, the easier it was to forge ahead with the book. So what I have in mind is actually bringing together a few different sources to discover how some of the, like you might say, broader concepts that frame Habermas's picture uh, actually help to understand the whole thing a little bit more readily. And one of those concepts, one of those larger frames, is functionalism. Another one is structuralism. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about Wittgensteinian theories about language. And we're also going to talk a little bit about the Marxist theory of surplus value. Now, like last week, I have a principle that I think organizes all of this that allows it to fall into place pretty naturally with what I think is really the most important idea in part one, which is that what Habermas is doing as a strategy in part one is governed by the idea that he wants to bring together a theory of systems, systems integration, systems regulation, as it applies to society, together with another concept that's more familiar to people who studied continental philosophy and Edmund Husserl in particular, the concept of a life world. So on the one hand, we have sociology, which tends to look at societies from kind of an objective, empirical point of view, and looks at societies from that third personal perspective as something that could be described either with an organic metaphor, as an organism that has a certain function, that has a certain purpose, perhaps a goal to its functioning, that has a system within it, like you could think of the example of the human heart, as having a purpose to pump blood and its parts as having a systematic arrangement in relation to that goal, in relation to that purpose, so that you can understand each one of its parts 
as having a function in relation to that goal. So if you were to ask someone from a functionalist perspective using this organic metaphor, you know, what is the function of the myocardia? Well, it's to squeeze the heart, so to speak, in untechnical language, to pump the blood out of the heart and into the arteries. So that organic metaphor allows you to see a very complex set of interrelationships among something that you could think of as a unitary whole as defined by a particular purpose, pur a particular goal, so that function and purpose go hand in hand and we have a nice objective way of describing a system. Now that can be contrasted with the idea of a life world, which Habermas relates more directly to the idea of social integration. Structural systems aim to describe a systematic integration of something. They describe system integration. But a life world involves describing a social integration. And the backdrop for that discussion, its organizing principle, is language itself. So what governs the integration of a life world as opposed to a system like the human heart is the system that language itself has as a system of signs that are all interrelated and signs refer to things on the one hand, but they also have meaning by being able to be differentiated from other signs. So on the one hand, we have a slab. On the other, we have a stone. On the other, we have a rock. And again, we have a brick. These are all related concepts. They all refer to different things, and they all derive their meaning partly by their differentiation, their capacity to be differentiated from other signs. And that is a Saussurean idea, one of the basic ideas behind linguistic theory. So there's a system of signs, and that system is able to govern and regulate through its own internal rules, its own internal mechanisms, a system of social integration so that communication can take place. Or rather, it is the precondition for communication to take place, for meaning to arise, for meaning to be expressed and be developed. Okay, so with that as the main governing idea of the rest of the discussion, we're going to look first at structuralism on the side of social structures. And our lead for this discussion is going to be Roland Barthes and his essay on the Eiffel Tower. Now, I thought this was an excellent essay, and I was looking for something that really captured the idea of structuralism. And when I went back over this essay, it really seemed to encapsulate, uh, through the use of a metaphor, all the basic ideas of structuralism uh, very well. I'm going to read to you the opening of this essay, which I think was very well written. Maupassant often lunched at the restaurant in the tower, though he didn't care much for the food. It's the only place in Paris, he used to say, where I don't have to see it. And it's true that you must take endless precautions in Paris not to see the Eiffel Tower. Whatever the season, through mist and cloud, on overcast days or in sunshine and rain, wherever you are, the landscape of roofs, domes, or branches separating you from it, the tower is there, 
incorporate it into daily life until you can no longer grant it any specific attribute, determined merely to persist like a rock or the river. It is literal as a phenomenon of nature whose meaning can be questioned to infinity, but whose existence is incontestable. There is virtually no Parisian glance it fails to touch at some time of day. At the moment I begin writing these lines about it, the tower is there, in front of me, framed by my window, and at the very moment the January night blurs it, apparently trying to make it invisible, to deny its presence, two little lights come on, winking gently as they revolve at its very tip. All this night, too, it will be there, connecting me above Paris to each of my friends that I know are seeing it. With it, we all comprise a shifting figure of which it is the steady center. The tower is friendly. The tower is also present to the entire world. First of all, as a universal symbol of Paris, it is everywhere on the globe where Paris is to be stated as an image. From the Midwest to Australia, there is no journey to France which isn't made somehow in the tower's name. No schoolbook poster or film about France which fails to propose it as the major sign of the people and of a place. It belongs to the universal language of travel. Further, beyond its strictly Parisian statement, it touches the most general humage image repertoire. Its simple primary shape confers upon it the vocation of an infinite cipher. In turn, and according to the appeals of our imagination, this symbol of Paris, of modernity, of communication, of science, or of the 19th century, rocket, stem, derrick, phallus, lightning rod, or insect, confronting the great itineraries of our dreams, it is the inevitable sign. Just as there is no Parisian glance which is not compelled to encounter it, there is no fantasy which fails sooner or later to acknowledge its form and to be nourished by it. Pick up a pencil and let your hand, in other words, your thoughts wander, and it is often the tower which will appear. Reduced to that simple line, whose sole mythic function is to join, as the poet says, base and summit, or again, earth and heaven. This pure, virtually empty sign is ineluctable because it means everything. In order to negate the Eiffel Tower, though the temptation to do so is rare, for the symbol offends nothing in us, you must, like Maupassant, get up on it, and, so to speak, identify yourself with it. Like man himself, who is the only one not to know his own glance, the tower is the only blind point of the total optical system of which it is the center and Paris the circumference. But in this movement which seems to limit it, the tower acquires a new power. An object, when we look at it, it becomes a lookout in its turn when we visit it, and now constitutes as an object simultaneously extended and collected beneath it, that Paris, which just now was looking at it. Okay, so I was saying that you can gather the main ideas of structuralism in this essay, and of course this is just the beginning, this is just enough to set the broad framework for that discussion. And the first question to ask here is, what does this tower represent? Notice that Maupassant sits in the tower so that he doesn't have to see the tower. And this is the only place, it seems, where one can be free of uh, being in a position where you might potentially see it or be aware of it. And sitting in the tower, by contrast, affords you a view of Paris. It gives you a sense of the layout of Paris, you might say, and as the structure and as the text will later on reveal, as a structure. You can see laid out before you the different 
neighborhoods and boulevards, the different shops, banks, financial center, universities, and all the different elements within that structure that make up the whole functioning organism, you might say, or machine, if you'd rather have a mechanical analogy, that together makes up the functional whole of the city. So what, what is this tower exactly? Well, one thing it may remind you of, if you know Foucault, is the centrality of the central tower inside the panopticon. Uh, from inside the panopticon, somebody can look out at a window and see a prisoner in any one of the cells within the prison without himself being seen. It's a way to survey, to have a kind of power of surveillance over prisoners within a prison. One can look out from within the central tower without being looked upon in return. There's a lack of reciprocity there that defines that power relation. And that essay is written later than this Roland Barthes essay about the Eiffel Tower. But it seems to have taken from it, I think, the correct idea that there's something about the tower that involves a position of authority, potential political authority. If the symbol is taken to represent a point where information can be organized and centralized, which is a uh, characteristic, especially of our information age economies. But in a broader sense, the tower could represent any sort of central organizing principle of a text where we have something we want to interpret. That's more of the natural home for um, Roland Barthes' remarks on the tower. So if I'm reading a poem or reading a novel, there might be something that I hit upon that kind of elucidates the landscape of the poem, that elucidates the meaning of the novel. And from that central point where I'm able to gather the meaning of the rest of the text, I can have a kind of vantage point and one of the things that Roland Barthes does very well with this analogy is, is he notes that by looking out from the tower, we have a vantage point from which we can perceive the structure as organized around this central point and not thereby reduce the elements within that structure to um, something immaterial or... Uh, you know, uh, by virtue of having this concept, so to speak, this, this starting point for interpretation, this central point of interpretation, uh, not abstract from the material reality of what we actually see around us. The baker's shops and the banks and the pedestrians and taxi drivers maintain their life within the city. They retain their reality. The vantage point does nothing to obscure the material reality that that view gives us. It simply lets all of these things be as they are without abstracting from them. And this does communicate some of the main ideas of structuralism. Structuralism searches for some sort of central organizing principle that affords us a vantage point. And the idea is not to kind of abstract somewhere outside of the text that obscures the reality of the elements in the text, but to find a point in the text, some sort of place of insight that allows us to organize and arrange all of the elements that we see within the text. And here the functional metaphor comes into play. Barthes says that what's characteristic of art is that everything within a particular piece of artwork serves some sort of purpose, 
has some sort of function. So there's nothing within art that is wasted. So any element within the city can be said to have some sort of function in relation to its other parts. And that's when we know we have a real central organizing principle. And this is not to say that there aren't other vantage points that we could find within the city. We could climb to the top of the Notre Dame Cathedral. My knowledge of the geography of Paris escapes me, but I imagine there are quite a few other uh, higher vantage points from which one could see the city laid out in front of them. And this is what structuralism tries to do. So one other thing I'll mention about functionalism before moving onward is that this is originally an Aristotelian idea. And Aristotle thought that this would be a very helpful way for understanding natural processes. It turns out that it applies very well to biological processes. And for anyone out there who's familiar with the four causes, we have the efficient cause, which is the moving cause. We have the material cause, which is the basic matter of the thing. Uh, we have a formal cause, which describes its structure. And then we have a final cause, which is the ultimate purpose or goal for which the thing exists to begin with. So the classic analogy that uh, is used by Heidegger is the material cause would be the material of which the shoe is made. Uh, we choose a particular material for such and such a purpose. Um, and so with the material cause, we are already presupposing some sort of final cause. And then we have the efficient cause, which is the person who is putting the material of the shoe together. And we have the formal cause, which is the idea of the eventual shape, product, uh, organized whole that the shoe is going to take when the material and the movement that puts the material together finally arrive at the finished product. So whether the shoe turns out to be a boot or a running shoe or some football cleats or whatever the case might be, all of these different um, causes are going to play different roles and you know we can end up choosing different types of material, different types of forms that the shoe would take. But what finally organizes the whole thing and gives it its purpose and meaning and gives purpose to the form of the shoe and its matter and, and to the production of the shoe is the final cause. Uh, to produce a shoe that is good for running, to produce a fashionable shoe, etc. So, and when it comes to the natural world, you could say that plants and animals can be explained by virtue of their final cause. Why does a flower have the particular parts that it does? Well, it's to achieve its end state, to achieve its goal, which is to produce seeds. You could explain everything that the plant does, its upward movement, its growth, it, the material of which it is made. You could explain everything about it in terms of its final cause. Okay, so another thing that I wanted to discuss was now looking to the other side of that original governing principle. Now that we've looked at the structural side, the system side, and a system really is just a functioning structure of some sort or presupposes a, a structure of some sort. And now looking at the other side of that original principle, let's talk a little bit about the life world and about language. So here I'm going to use Wittgenstein as my foil for this discussion. And Wittgenstein's analogy of chess to try to illustrate some ideas about language. 
And when two people sit down to play chess, some rules for the game are presupposed. And the question might arise whether you could look at language as a kind of game of chess, which presupposes certain rules, and whether those rules could be used as a way to try to break down some sort of theory about meaning, um, some sort of way to go directly from a sign to what it signifies in some sort of rigid way that would help us to systematize the project of understanding how meaning gets created out of language. And Wittgenstein thinks that that sort of project is simply not going to work. What Bertrand Russell tried to do, and Russell was uh, Wittgenstein's teacher, they had quite a few discussions and the two of them famously argued together in, in Russell's office, was something antithetical to those conclusions that Wittgenstein drew. What Russell wanted to do is make language function a little bit more like logic, to make language function a little bit more like math. So in math, you can go directly from the symbols, one, two, three, four, five, to their meaning, and there is no risk of uh, misunderstanding at least so Russell would want to uh, Russell would want to you know take that point as far as he can and within that system of signs and symbols we can generate a clear meaning clear relationships between signs and reference which allows us to use logic as a tool to arrive at clear and distinct ideas just starting with language as a system of simple, clear-cut signifiers that have stable meanings, we can arrive at some kind of um, clear and distinct systematic philosophy of things. Carnap, who followed um, Russell's attempt to do this, used the analogy of a map and thought that maybe language could could function as a map, that uh, in the same way that a map kind of um, gives you all of the interrelationships between all the different things that are in the topography of a, of a particular area, it shows you all of the systemic interrelationships. You could have a system of signs that relates directly to things in the world in the same way that a map relates to particular geographical area. But that was a project that Wittgenstein was destined to overthrow. The primary argument that he uses to do that is his introduction of the concept of use. So instead of thinking of language as being primarily generated by a system of signs that a learner learns how to use to refer to things, Wittgenstein uh, saw meaning and the ability to refer to things as generated by use, which involves a much broader set of, which involves a social context, with, which involves something much broader that brings you into a context that's more at home with with the concept of something like a life world. So language has, gets its, uh, gets its significance as an outcome, not of someone teaching someone stable meanings and how to refer to a thing, which is what St. Augustine thought uh, language was. Um, this is a way that Augustine uh, describe language learning, but through usage. And uh, with, the, with the analogy of chess, one of the things that can be brought up is whether 
In learning chess, it is impossible to simply learn the game by simply following along and imitating the, the moves that you're taught to make without actually explicitly referring to a rule book somewhere. And can't that also be a way that chess is played? And you certainly can imagine uh, somebody learning chess without ever actually referring to an official rule book to find out exactly how the pieces move or what to do in a particular situation. However, a rule book of sorts can be appealed to if people have differences of opinion. But the way in which people chess, play chess can be seen also as potentially entirely an outcome of people showing other people how a thing is done without ever actually referring to a specific set of rules. I'm going to read uh, some of Weissman's remarks on this. So this is chapter 7 of Friedrich Weissman's Principles of Linguistic Philosophy. So the chapter is entitled, What is a Rule? Number one, rules in a game. Clear examples of what are called rules are to be found in games, for example, in chess. In teaching the game, the rules are explained by means of examples, and these may be illustrations of isolated situations on the board, or they may be selected moves from a match which is actually being played. In this case, a rule is something spoken or written down as in a chess manual, but it may be that chess is taught solely by means of examples, and that only later, when some special opportunity presents itself, such a dispute between the players is one drawn to pay particular attention to the rules. Without board and chessmen, one cannot play the game. But a board and chessmen are of no use if there are no rules for the game. In this sense, we may include the rules as a part of the apparatus of the game. What is the function of a rule? How does it enter into the game? Where is it employed? There are two essentially different cases here. Number one, the use of the rule enters into the game itself, that is, is embodied within the procedure of the game. Suppose that the rules for moving, a, moving the pieces are set out in the table. From each piece pictured on a chessboard, arrows are drawn indicating its possible moves. Imagine that the way the game is played is this. Before each move, one looks at the table sees which moves are possible, and carries out one of them. Number two, the other case is that in which the use of the rule is not a separable part of the procedure of playing the game, but is referred to afterwards. Is it necessary to think of the rules while playing the game? Does one, for instance, say them over to oneself before every move? The beginner may do so, but the experienced player moves without being conscious of the rules. Only when the correctness of a move is challenged will he refer to the rule. There is a temptation to say that while in the first case the rule guides the action, in the second it justifies it. But in both cases the rule may be invoked to justify a move. The difference is that in the first case, the appeal to the rules is made within the game, whereas in the second, it is not part of the procedure of the game and may become necessary only when a conflict arises between the players. Okay, so you can think of the chessboard and the chessmen as involving a system. The system has to have its rules but this is a different sort of system than the kind of mechanical or organic metaphor that was used in describing um, a system that is looked at as a way from a third-person perspective of describing a social systematic relationship and its functional integrations. Instead, uh, the proper home for this, or the more natural home for this, is a life world 
um, where the players in this game are using their own personal experiences to play together, and it's the rules, and according to the uh, metaphor, the rules of the language which form a system which allow people to communicate. And it's that capacity to communicate, to learn meanings from other people without necessarily referring to a dictionary or a rule book that becomes a nice way of bringing out the, the concept of usage and how the way in which we generate meaning socially resists some kind of more systematic treatment where it can be brought down to axioms, first principles, but is in itself a ground floor. Wittgenstein uses the term spade depth, and language can be thought of as the ultimate spade depth in describing how this life world functions. Metaphysical concepts are one of the casualties of this way of thinking, where it's sometimes uh, brought out that with language, we can reduce all our ideas about ultimate metaphysical processes. If we're using language as the ultimate spade depth, we can reduce those metaphysical ideas to language itself. So everything um, that we regard as uh, some sort of object of stable meaning, of permanence, in our world is really a creation of our social interaction and usage of different words to refer to things, which is a outcome of our social interactions and, and our history. And there's no way to dig deeper than that in um, Wittgenstein's view. And this is a uh, this is an approach that is common to continental philosophy, as well as to a lot of uh, early 20th century uh, analytic philosophy. Okay, so from that point, I'm going to move on to the discussion of Marxism as one more tool that we can add to our toolbox when we're reading this text by Habermas. The concept we're going to be focusing on which is going to be the last one for tonight, is the idea of surplus value. And I'm just going to read from Heilbronner here. He has this book that I found very useful called Marxism For and Against. I think Heilbronner might actually be a very underrated writer. He wrote very voluminously about different social issues, wrote a lot of history, so here we are in Marxism for and against, and I'm reading from page 107. Marx discovered what he believed to be the innermost secret of capitalism. The secret is that profit is won, not as a result of sharp dealing in the commodity market, but as a normal part of the production process, not in exchange but prior to exchange in production itself. The source of profit lies in the appropriation by the capitalist of the surplus value, or the difference between the value of labor power sold as a commodity by the working class and the value of the product of that labor, which accrues to the capitalist at the end of the production process. The theory of surplus value is central to Marx's socioanalysis, and we must take a moment to subject it to critical inquiry. At the core of the idea is the difference between labor and labor power. Labor power is the capacity for work that an employer buys when he, when he hires a worker for a day or a week. Labor, on the other hand, is the actual expenditure of human energy and intelligence that becomes embodied in the commodities that laborers create. Marx's theory of surplus value asserts that there must be a systemic, systematic difference between the two, that one must always be able to buy the capacity for work for less than the value that will be created when the capacity is put to use 
and commodities are produced. Indeed, it is only because this difference exists that capital itself can be brought into being. So, first of all, what does this tell us about surplus value? What is surplus value? Well, surplus value is simply the amount of profit that an employer can make above and beyond the expenditure that they are um, laying out to pay an employee's wages. So if you are a very productive employee, like let's say, you know, using some of my personal experience, let's say you go to a um, factory that involves um, breaking down watermelons. And let's say that one of your tasks is to peel the watermelons so that the watermelons can be uh, broken down further into another product somewhere else. If you can find a way to peel the watermelon more quickly, that will make you more productive. And as a result, it will create more profits for your employer. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that you will get paid more or that you will be recognized for your innovation, but it means that you will be creating more profit. And the value of your labor will be higher than it was previously or maybe more valuable than the other workers who are there. And Marx thinks that this idea lies at the very heart of capitalism and makes it such that capitalism is, at its very foundation, an exploitative system. So I'll just read that sentence again. Marx's theory of surplus value asserts that there must be a systematic difference between the two, that one must always be able to buy the capacity of work for less than the value that will be created when that capacity is put to use and commodities are produced. Indeed, it is only because this difference exists that capital itself can be brought into being. So capital there could mean, um, you know, just the means to purchase further means of production or, you know, uh, the wealth that one accrues, however one wishes to dispose of it. And um, Marx thinks that you know, it's not the exchange of goods and services, as I, as I said earlier, the exchange in the marketplace that creates profits, but it's what happens prior to the good arriving in the market. It's those people who labored productively or unproductively, and whether the employer himself is um, able to make a good profit over and above the wages that he has to pay out. So if there's a company that's making a lot of profit, Marx would say, it's because the laborers are highly productive and they're not getting paid very much. So the incentive that is latent within that system, this, the incentive, Marx thinks, to exploit is always there. The, the, the way to improve profit, according to this paradigm, is simply to pay your workers the least amount possible and get them to be as productive as possible. And uh, the thing is that this idea has never been able to be verified empirically. Um, it is simply kind of a philosophical axiom that Marx came up with as he was developing this theory. So it's not a theory that is uh, confirmed by um, economics, but it's one that that's more kind of in an area where nobody has actually been able to uh, confirm whether this supposition is actually true. 
it turns out that profit, the whole concept of profit, is a difficult subject for economics to um, try to grapple with. And uh, this I'm relying on uh, Heilbronner's exposition for. But if you think about it, um, there are ways for the worker to try to take advantage of this system. Um, supposing that this is true, um, what it would be imperative for the worker to reduce his or her um, exploitability would be perhaps to look at the situation where one is selling one's labor as a commodity and ask oneself how you can make that commodity more valuable, more expensive, more scarce, and more highly in demand. And the way to do that would be by learning skills that are in demand and that are scarce. And indeed, if you look out at the economic landscape today, you can see that that is in fact the case, that that is a way for labor to try to quote unquote capitalize on its own potential to try to extract as much as it can from a potential employer. Um, because in that case, if you're thinking about this as two people entering the marketplace, one has leverage over the other. One has a, a good a commodity, their own labor, skills, and expertise that is scarce and is highly in demand. And in that situation, the laborer can demand higher wages. I mentioned earlier that I have some experience in working in factory setting. And I think that this experience has given me a lot of insight into the genesis of some of Marx's ideas. And I feel like, you know, it is kind of the natural home for where Marxism makes the most sense. If you're thinking back to the 19th century, to the um, you know, heyday of industrialism, um, large factories, large pools of unskilled labor, um, before the days of public school education, um, during a time when um, technology hadn't advanced far enough so that there were a lot of um, different jobs available for people to you know, gain, gain skills in order to find better modes of um, employment so that you just had a large, basically homogenous labor pool. That is a situation where you could very easily exploit and try to capitalize um, on the labor pool itself. If you are someone who owns the means of production, I mean, even that very terminology has its natural home in this 19th century world of industrial, um, industrial might and factory wheels turning and machines moving things down an assembly line. If you're somebody who owns the means of production, you have invested capital in an infrastructure that is something that the workers have to maintain and they have to strive to make as productive as possible. And they are, in a sense, always working in the shadow of technological development itself. One of the points that Heilbronner brings up is that there, there can come times when um, the population, let's say, more widely employed than at other times. And in those cases, wages tend to rise. 
as each worker becomes more scarce and com can command higher wages. So those wages tend to rise. But one way that an employer can deal with that problem to try to suppress the um, increase of those wages is by introducing some technology, inter introducing some uh, more mechanized manufacturing capacity, because that in itself can be utilized as a way to make the, um, their reliance on a large pool of labor um, less of a factor, so that in effect tilts the supply-demand calculus back in the favor of the, um, of the owner of the means of production. So it, in effect, uh, reduces the employer's uh, dependence on the number of laborers that he or she will have to hire. They can, they can always tilt the market back in their favor by um, reducing the need for a large supply of labor by introducing more mechanized means of producing things. Okay, so one of the, the, the main point here that I want to um, bring out of this discussion of surplus labor, first of all, what it is, secondly, the idea that Marx thought that this was the core idea behind what makes capitalism an inherently exploitative system, that the idea itself has never been shown to be correct. It is actually just kind of an idea that Marx had that made his philosophical system fit together. And I'm just going to uh, read to you a little bit what um, Heilbronner actually says about that. So this is reading from Marxism for and against by Robert L. Heilbronner, and this is page 107. The idea has a prima facie plausibility in the historic setting in which Marx conceived it, a setting unforgettably portrayed in the ferocious chapter of Capital on the Working Day. As we read the accounts of English factory labor employed for 12 and 14 hour days and paid near a near starvation wage, the existence of surplus value seems, an un, seems as undeniable as the naked extraction of a surplus from slave labor. In fact, however, there is no proof that surplus value existed even under these conditions. If wages were low, so was productivity. Competition among employers was fierce and profits in many sweated trades may have been very low or even nil. Marx's depiction of surplus value carries the conviction of his outraged sense of justice, but even he did not claim to have proved its presence by a resort to empirical evidence. Okay, and I'm going to skip down to Heil Bronner's concluding remarks. As such, the theory of surplus value provides an explanation for the problem that has always been the, Achille, the Achilles heel of economics, namely the source of profits. Unwilling to attribute profits to the transfer of wealth from one class to another, bourgeois economists have struggled in vain to explain profits not as a transient monopoly return or as an evanescent technological advantage but as a persistent central feature of the system of capitalism. To a limited extent, Adam Smith acknowledged the source of all profits in a deduction from the reward to labor and to a bolder but still incomplete degree, Cardo did the same. Thereafter, all efforts to explain profits disappeared before the fetishism that attribute rent to the productivity of the land and interest to profits to that of, and interest or profits to that of capital. 
Marx's contribution was not only to remove the disguise that allowed land and capital to appear as things rather than social relations, but also to explain how the forces generated by the capitalist mode could systematically depress the values of labor power below the value that it bequeathed to commodities. The purpose of the theory of surplus value is therefore to explain what is otherwise inexplicable. The presence of an enduring, although ever-threatened surplus within the capitalist mode of production. As such, it remains an essential part of Marx's socio-analysis, without which we cannot penetrate to the core of the capitalist system. So one thing that I will say about this is it's important to note here that even if we can't confirm that um, the theory of surplus value is empirically correct, I think it can be acknowledged that it is certainly one way that a factory owner or anybody who runs a business who employs people can try to make a profit. Um, in some cases, you'll notice that if someone owns a restaurant, sometimes they'll have people in their family working there as employees. And it's certainly the case that by doing that, they can cut costs and make better profits and they can manage to stay in business for a longer time. So I think it goes without question that it is one way that someone who wants to make money, stay in business or thrive and try to make as much money as they can, can make more profit. And when you look back at the history of globalization since the 1980s, you could read the internationalization of manufacturing that capital flight from the United States into other countries as an attempt to simply exploit labor in other countries by undercutting the American laborer. One of the arguments that's sometimes used against the American laborer is that foreign laborers, laborers who uh, have come to the United States um, migrating from foreign countries who are here illegally are willing to do jobs that American laborers are not willing to do. And I think you can recognize in there perhaps an attempt to manipulate. Um, sometimes it has a racial component. Sometimes they'll say, well, workers of one race are um, more productive or more industrious, or they're willing to do things that are spoiled, well-fed, privileged American laborers are not willing to do. But in fact, what the employer himself is actually doing is creating a smokescreen for his own exploitation of, of labor. So they're justifying not paying American laborers and handing over a job to somebody who will do it for less money. Um, and exploitation is something that does exist. There's a lot of pressure out there for people to increase profits. And part of that is keeping wages down so that those, pros so that those profits can increase. Um, that certainly is the reality of a capitalist system. But as I've said before, if there is a remedy for a laborer to um, work against this system, it's to try to move out of position where they can be easily exploited. And that is by using those market forces to his or her advantage. By having a skill that's highly in demand and that is also scarce. And those, um, those means 
nowadays of the means of gaining those skills nowadays are available in technical colleges, community colleges, um, where the cost of tuition is not as high as at some of the universities out there. So with that, I'm going to say good night. And that is the end of this episode.